Welcome everyone to this DLTV webinar on the 18th of August 2022 and today we welcome Dr. Matthew Harrison uh, and I'll ask Matt to introduce himself properly in a moment but uh, Matt is both DLTV's Vice President but he's also uh, Co-Director of Student Experience at the University of Melbourne Graduate School of Education and of particular interest this afternoon is his thesis which examined how cooperative video games can be used as spaces for developing social capabilities, uh, particularly for students with disabilities and neurological differences. Um, and then Matt will talk about how he's built on that research uh, to co-found Next Level Collaboration. Uh, we do ask everyone to keep your microphones uh, and cameras off, unless you're invited to talk by Matt. Um, but, you know, there'll be uh, time for questions at the end, but we do encourage you to ask questions in the chat anyway, as, as Matt's proceeding, and, and we'll be able to keep, keep track of those and hopefully answer those as we go. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to uh, Dr. Matthew Harrison. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan, and hello, everyone. Wonderful to be here. Um, I do love working with fellow teachers and then having these really rich conversations. Um, I'm going to watch the chat. Nathan as well. I'm going to try to keep track of the questions and answer them at the end of the slide. Um, but if I miss your question, please do feel free, Nathan or, or Kev or anyone else, just to turn your microphone on, just ask me uh, at the end of the slide. It's always fine. It's, it's fantastic. Okay, welcome. And I really, it is one of my favourite things to do in these seminars. I'd like to begin uh, just with the knowledge of the country and just not just um, stay up front that I acknowledge the traditional custodians of land and waters of Australia and pay my respect to all elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and we have a collective responsibility to work towards a more inclusive future for everyone. And that theme of inclusion you'll see is running right through uh, my presentation today. Uh, so when we talk about inclusion, it's really about making sure that everyone, students and staff, feel safe, happy and want to come to school. Just to give you some background on myself, um, I know some people <laughs> in the in today's session, some people I haven't met before, so it's very nice to meet you. Um, I'm a teacher by trade. I uh, worked initially teaching in South Korea, and then I worked in Melbourne for a few years, and then I worked in the UK. Uh, when I came home from the UK, I, I worked in a special development school. I know some people on this call work in special development schools, but if you're not familiar with special development schools, they're schools for kids with complex needs arising from disabilities or, or neurological differences. And they work with kids with, um, I guess, behaviors that we consider that are uh, extremely complex and require specialized assistance. There is a big move to find ways to include these kids with complex behavioral and communication needs find ways to include them in, in our mainstream schools. Uh, I currently work as a senior lecturer at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, uh, and I train teachers to support students who are on the autism spectrum. And this is really my area of passion. I, I love working uh, with the neurodivergent community, and I love learning from uh, neurodiverse-led or neurodivergent-led organisations like the ICANN Network, like Yellow Ladybugs, and my colleagues here, we, I'm very, very proud that we have a number of neurodivergent colleagues at the University of Melbourne who I've learned so much from. So I'm hoping to share some of what I've learned today with you. But if there's anyone here who has lived experience, I'd love to hear your experiences too. My research really revolves around gaming and gaming culture and using things such as VR and AR as tools for learning. And I'm really particularly interested in the idea of collaborative play as a vehicle for academic, and, uh, but more importantly, social, from my lens, social learning, and for creating inclusive school communities. I'm going to talk a little bit later on about what exactly that means. I am a gamer. I am currently, I've got into Stray. I, uh, which if you haven't played Stray, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I've been playing a bit more of Sea of Thieves with my friends online. I uh, got back into Vermitide 2 recently, and I'm a massive Legend of Zelda fan. Uh, I do have the remaster on the Wii U of Twilight Princess, and it's a brilliant game. So what are we going to, what exactly are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to talk about 
bit, a bit of it's, it's a bit sort of uh, historical. Oh, I've heard good things about Stray, but not time to play. It. Yes, yes, Melinda. School holidays, highly recommended. Um, so when we talk about today's session, we're going to talk about my interest, why I'm interested particularly in digital games based intervention, as opposed to digital games based learning. I'm going to frame this around how we understand autism and inclusion. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about ways that we can position video games as learning tools. To help you to do this, I'm going to share two case studies. Because as a teacher, I think it's really important that we think about what does this look like in the classroom at that implementation level. Then I'm going to talk about game design because this is really important because the games are the tools we use that can create the conditions for collaboration. This is a really big emphasis in my work is that teachers have a vital role in teaching the collaborative skills that we're focusing on, but games can help create the conditions where players work together. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on challenges and then I've got time for questions and answers at the end. Hope this sounds like a good session for you. And hopefully if I don't answer something in the presentation, I'll be able to answer the questions at the end and give you some really concrete next steps. So, um, <laughs> my interest in this field. Um, that's a photo of myself and my younger brother with our very stylish matching bowl cuts. Thanks, Mum. Uh, we grew up playing games together. And we had an old 286 computer, like the one in the picture here. And we had a neighbourhood full of kids who'd come around and play it together. When I think back about how I developed a lot of my social skills or social capabilities, it was time spent around sharing one keyboard, trying to come up with systems for a, taking turns, working on our expressive and receptive and pragmatic language about how we give instructions, how we check for understanding, but also figuring out how we negotiate and resolve disputes. And all those skills developed around play are actually the skills that we now know are really, really important for kids to be able to access the human rights, those collaborative problem solving skills, to be able to gain meaningful employment, to get a work in an Australian workplace or international workplace, but also they're skills that help to make people to feel socially included, like they're part of society and that they have um, real, real value uh, to their communities. So that's why I really originally became interested in this space. Um, as a teacher, I started, I started running gaming clubs like many of you are, I know. And this is back in the, the mid 2000s. And I found that a lot of the kids I was working with could do things in the context of playing collaborative video games together with me or with other students that they couldn't do in PE, they couldn't do in science class. And, I, and as a, you know, as a, a master student, I began to really think about why is this the case? So that became my PhD journey. Um, how can we use games and the affordances of games to best be able to leverage their affordances to be able to teach skills that are important for every kid to learn? To begin this conversation, I'd really like just to, to ask, um, to talk about neurodiversity and inclusion and what exactly we mean. So as a starting point, I'll just ask you in the chat to please, and this is a, a low stakes test, you don't have to answer the question, but what exactly do we mean by autism? So what are the defining traits according to the DSM-5? Now, the DSM-5 is the diagnostic manual we use to diagnose autism, or we don't as teachers, but allied health professionals do. And this is controversial. But according to the diagnostic criteria, if someone has been diagnosed with autism, does it mean that they have A, differences in social communication interaction, B, a cognitive or intellectual disability, C, both differences in social communication and interaction and a cognitive disability, or D, and none of the above? I'll give people just a second to, to put their answers in the chat if they'd like to. And I'll give, just give you... 20 seconds thinking time. Do you know what? 
for the longest time, I thought when I was first started teaching, just to give you some context, I had half a day of um, instruction in my about disability and, and neurological differences in my entire D ed. Um, and I thought that autism meant that someone had a, a type of intellectual disability. And so this is really, really a sign that we probably don't cover this enough in teacher education. But Nicole, um, well done. Uh, your answer is correct. It's A, when we're talking about autism, I really like this, de this de first definition. It's the idea that it's a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition. So it's someone that someone has for their entire life um, that interferes or creates differences with the person's ability to communicate and relate to others. So that first definition talks about being a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition. It means it's something that they have, uh, it's something that they have from birth. We often don't pick it up until early childhood because that's the first time when we start seeing them interact. But the DSM-5 has two defining challenges. So there's the impairment, and I don't like this deficit-based language, so I use the word differences. Differences in social communication and interaction and restricted patterns of behavior, interest, or activity. So this means the idea of really, uh, things like circumscribed interests, really intense interests, or in activities or you know special interests and the idea of social communication interaction. So for someone to be diagnosed as autistic, they have to have both of those things and it has to be a lifelong condition. So it has to be something that they've had all their life. It may not be detected until a certain age, particularly with um, girls and women. We know that our instruments for diagnosing autism or even for our screening, our screening tests really are biased towards boys or people identify as male but we know that it should be 50% of the population. So when we're talking about autism, we're really looking at a social interaction and communication and those patterns of repeated patterns of behavior. So my, or my understanding of autism has changed a lot. So you see on the left-hand side, there's a uh, young Matt with uh, less gray hairs. <laughs> that was early in my teaching career. Um, and you can see that I've, uh, I have definitely got a few more gray hairs since. I think working in schools can definitely help you develop gray hairs. Um, and I've really changed my understanding. This is really based on my, my getting to know a lot of autistic students a lot of, and a lot of autistic uh, colleagues, but also um, getting to really um, learn about from my autistic friends about the the idea that we're thinking about differences to celebrate and we need to fix our environment. So it's about creating inclusive um, environments that help our neurodivergent kids or autistic students to be able to access uh, school, to be able to join in their local community and to develop the skills so that they can operate in a neurotypically normed world. So that means that for example, there's nothing wrong with being autistic. It just means that you might speak Spanish and I speak German. There's nothing wrong with Spanish or German, just it's different languages and different ways of communicating. But when most people speak Spanish, if I speak German, it's good for me to learn a bit of Spanish to be able to access that other people and communicate with other people in the world. But likewise, it's very good for other people who are who meets someone who speaks German to speak a little bit of German. So there's that two-way communication is possible. Now, some people said that autism uh, and intellectual disability is the same thing. Often some people who have been diagnosed with autistic or in some cases will have a co-occurring intellectual disability. That's about 30% of the population. So about 30% of people who are autistic will also have a co-occurring or comorbid if you're using medical language intellectual disability, but about 70% of our kids who are autistic won't have an intellectual disability and often are identified as being gifted or twice exceptional or having above average ranges of, on an IQ test, which in itself is a problematic measure. So I just wanted to clear that up. What exactly are we talking about? Um, this, here's some examples from the DSM-5 really talking about common areas of challenge that 
uh, our children who are autistic or children with autism may experience in developing and maintaining unsafe relationships. Um, some of these are pretty heartbreaking. So difficulties adjusting behavior to suit various social contexts, difficulties in sharing imaginative play. I, I don't know if that one's true. Um, maybe that's have different play looks different for some of these kids. Difficulties in making friends. Yeah, I see that a lot with a lot of the autistic kids that I work with. Um, apparent absence of interest in peers. And that's, there's differences in how interest is expressed. So what play looks like to some of the kids I work with is sitting in a room with their friends, playing the same game on their Nintendo Switches. It doesn't look like they're talking, but they're playing together in their mind. And, and for them, it's meaningful. Um, difficulties in detecting the difference between friendly joking and bullying. I've seen that going both ways, where someone is um, having a joke that's you know sort of a playful joke that's not meant to be a, you know, not meant to be mean or to be hurting someone's feelings, and the person has interpreted that in a different way, um, or a, a child who doesn't know that the rest the kids are actually being really horrible to them. They think that's what friendship is supposed to look like, which is in itself a very sad thing. Um, I, I don't like the next one, difficulties in sharing and joining with others. I don't think that's correct. That is in the DSM-5 manual. So this is what uh, psychiatrists or psychologists would use but, um, to diagnose. But I've most of my kids or all of my kids share and join with others. It just looks different. And challenges in inferring the interests of others. We know about that um, really special, they've got a really intense interest in Minecraft. They may want to talk about Minecraft with you all day long, even though you're supposed to be talking about, uh, you know, William and Normandy in 1066. So it's really the idea that um, some students find it difficult to understand that people aren't interested in mini beasts or uh, the Spanish Civil War, or these really, uh, these areas of special interest. Um, and challenges displaying cognitive empathy. So this is like knowing what someone else might be thinking based on knowledge of their background. So the idea that if I'm talking to Nathan, who we met earlier today, the host for today, and I know that Nathan works at DLTV, I can infer that he probably has an interest in technology based on the background information I know about Nathan. Some of the kids that I work with do find it really difficult to integrate the information they know about someone and then uh, use that to make judgments about what should we talk about. Okay, and there's a whole lot of strengths for our kids who are, who are on the autism spectrum. So things like we know from the research, an analytical approach to evaluation and problem solving. So they can use these skills they derive from these areas of special interest. Um, character strengths. Uh, a, a really good example of that is the idea of, of an, um, a focus on fairness and truth and the idea that they won't try to fit in with the social environment. They're not fussed by that. They'll do the right thing, what they think is morally right. And much um, it creates a whole lot of problems for the kids uh, in, in social environments when they will, when the teacher will ask, okay, who did that? they will really want to tell you the honest truth who did it. And that can create an environment of bullying. But as a society, we really do, um, we really do uh, value, we, we purport to value fairness and truth. It's just helping our kids to understand the social implications of dobbing in the kid who threw the rubber at the teacher when they turned around. Um, so, but uh, these are strengths. And I said, finally, what do we mean by inclusive communities? So the idea, we want communities where everyone feels safe, like they belong, they are valued for being true to themselves. We don't want them to have to mask or pretend to be someone else. And inclusive schools that we want to create as teachers celebrate these differences and recognise that we all have strengths, we all have challenges, and what we do as teachers, and that leads into digital games-based intervention, is we use our students' strengths to address our areas of challenge. So we have a question around what are inclusive social skills? Which skills, if, if we're talking about differences rather than deficits, which social skills should we be focusing on? And the argument, I would argue we should be focusing on functional collaborative skills rather than these normalizing cultural social skills. 
An example of a normalizing cultural skill is eye contact. Um, so my colleague Jess, who I work with, is an autistic woman, and she will often say, I can either look at you when you're speaking or I can listen to you. When I'm making eye contact with you, I find it really, really intense and my brain can't process what you're saying. We also know in other culture, from other cultural backgrounds, like a lot of in some First Nations uh, Australians communities, eye contact with um, adults is seen as quite disrespectful. So where we focus our energy is on teaching these collaborative social skills. So things like giving, using your voice to give instructions or using non, uh, giving nonverbal instructions, things like taking turns, that's relevant to every culture and every background. Now, how you take turns might look different, but it's really focused on what's most meaningful, uh, what's the way that we perform those skills are meaningful for the students, but also that their communication partner, the person who they're working with or the group they're working with, understand what they're saying or what they're trying to communicate. So the focus of our work is really on collaborative social skills. All right, two forms of inclusive play. Are there any questions? Nathan, I'll take a breath there and a drink. Are there any questions from anyone at this point? No questions yet in the chat, but if you do have a question or even just a comment, please feel free to put that in the chat as we go along, and then uh, Matt will be able to address that uh, when the time is right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so when I talk about inclusive play and the research that I do, um, we're really looking at two different models. There's the virtual playground model, which I know some people here, because I've spoken with you, use, and then there's structured digital games-based intervention. I'm going to mainly focus on digital games-based intervention today, but I just want to emphasize that the virtual playground model is a really, really important model. Actually, I, I'm running this tonight. Um, no worries. Well, you're always happy. Oh, yes. I'd like to know. I'll answer that at the end. We'll talk about that. And hello, Roger. No worries at all. Um, so virtual playground model and the digital and digital games-based intervention. I run servers for virtual playground model and I run digital games-based intervention sessions. I do both. When I'm talking about virtual playgrounds, these are student-led uh, with interactions supported by teaching staff when needed. I've got the example of Yellowcraft here. That's a server uh, that we run, that I run with Jess, on behalf of Yellow Ladybugs. Yellow Ladybugs is a, um, a charity that supports autistic young, uh, girls and women or people who identify as non-binary. And it's a safe space for them to come and to hang out and to work together. And everyone on that server has a diagnosis of autism or is a sibling or close friend. So this virtual playground model celebrates the differences of autism and allows neurodivergent players and neurodiverse players to engage on their terms. It's really, really, uh, it's a free flowing playground style system where we provide examples of activities they can work on, but we allow them to interact and choose their own projects. And it's much less structured than digital games based intervention. We do, of course, want to make sure that it's a safe space and that everyone feels welcome. So we co-design our expected uh, community values and behaviours, and we do that through using um, a Google form uh, to run a survey and co-construct a values expected behaviours matrix, which originally is something that you'd see in a PBS school, but lots of other schools, a positive behaviour support schools, if you're not unfamiliar, but we're seeing this being used in lots of schools that have lots of different behavior programs. Looks something a bit like this. So the idea of having concrete examples of what do we as a community want when playing together. So we've got playing together in the room, using voice and text chat, including Discord, which is, a, which is what we use to communicate and playing in the game world. And we asked our participants, our, our players, how can they always be safe? How can they always act responsibly? And how can they always show respect? And then we tried to use their language and bring together their language to really co-construct a set of community guidelines around this. So this is really essential that you do let the players take center stage and to really think about what they need 
what they need to be able to feel what they can be safe on this in this space because we know a lot of um i see there's a lot of people who are running minecraft here a lot of minecraft servers are fantastic if you've ever heard Stuart duncan speak who's the the founder of Warcraft, which is the largest autism focused minecraft server in the world um there's also historically been a lot of bullying on open minecraft servers uh particularly of the autistic or uh, neurodivergent community um so Oh, and also, you know, other minorities and other groups, marginalized groups. So I'd really, um, I'd really emphasize having this idea of a set of community guidelines so that everyone understands what it means when playing together to be safe, to act responsibly and to show respect. Thanks, Helen. My main area of research is digital games-based interventions. This is a structured program. Student voice, of course, still matters. We use lots of visual supports. We have an intervention role, interventionist role uh, for teaching staff and allied health workers where we're really leading a lot of the teaching. It's a, we provide a system for intervention that we originally co-designed with students who have neurological differences and disabilities. And we use position games as tools that create the conditions for collaboration. Teachers have a fundamental role. They teach the skills using explicit teaching for skill acquisition, and they coach the players so they can perform the skill. And that's really around the based on the research we know around this. Skill acquisition is one specific problem. That's knowing the steps required for performing a certain skill. It's knowing when, can, when a skill can be helpful and what are the benefits of using a targeted skill. We know from many kids we work with, they can tell you what the definition of turn taking and provide examples until the cows come home. The real area of challenge is around skill performance and that's emotionally and cognitively regulating themselves to be able to recognize that now's a good time for me to hand the control to someone else or for me to let someone else jump on that platform. And that is the value of teaching both helping supporting skill acquisition, but also coaching our players so they can learn to perform the skill at the point of need. So we use a three stage process. We use stage A, which is based on video modeling and video review. We provide a system for coaching during play. And then we have a system for facilitating guided reflection stage C. Stage A is around skill acquisition. So it's using video examples of showing how a skill can be used when you'd use a skill how are uh, the steps in performing that skill and the benefits of using that skill. But we also use unedited footage to help the kids to give us feedback around when they sh think they would use a skill and why someone may or may not have chosen to use a skill at a particular point of time. The really important thing with stage A is we're using video footage recorded in the previous session of the kids themselves. So we record the, the kids in the physical space and they're all together in the same physical space. And then we record the virtual environment too. And we play it back to them, a bit like a Twitch stream. They love it. And then we edit and create video models of things we really wanna show them. But then we also show them unedited footage and get them to talk us through it. A bit like a game tape after a football game or a lacrosse game, Kev. Sorry, I'll use a lacrosse example for Kev. Um, stage B, <laughs> no worries. Stage B is the coaching. So that's when we actually have the kids playing and we're stepping back and we're coaching them at the point of need and helping them to, and I'm gonna show you a system for doing this, supporting them in actually we're playing together and working together. Stage C is guided reflection. This is really important. This is when we talk about the skills we've used and not used and we set goals for the next time. And we talk about how we can, I hate the word generalize when it comes to social skills. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's accurate. How we can transport skills we've practiced in gameplay to other contexts in their life. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. 
So when I did the research around this, we filmed the kids during stage A using GoPros. We also recorded them in stage B, but we recorded the footage on, in the gameplay as well. And then we recorded stage C. When they were playing together in stage B, we actually used video analysis. I analyzed about 10 hours of footage uh, of the kids playing together and mapped when they were using particular skills, the conditions in which they were using them, and what the teaching staff were doing. So this is really fine grained video analysis. Working with the, um, the students through using interviews and reflections, I also got their voices and their feedback as well as from my, my teaching assistants as well. So I worked with my own students. They were familiar with me, I knew them, uh, and we worked together on developing a structure for this program. And then we also, I also use the video analysis to try to think about how I can increase the frequency of skill performance, how often they use the skill, but also the sophistication that they're using each of these targeted skills. I also looked at what was happening in the physical space in the classroom, but also what was happening in the virtual world and tried to identify those enablers and barriers. This is just to give you a bit of background around the methodology of how we came up with the program. So I want to talk a bit about uh, case studies of uh, virtual playgrounds and digital based uh, digital game based intervention. I'll start with um, Yellowcraft. So this is the idea of a free flowing uh, playground environment that you may run as a lunchtime group. If you're working with a group of students who are really struggling at, um, at lunch times, running a Friday um, a really with that unstructured play, um, or who don't seem to be socially connected, and you may run a lunchtime Minecraft club, which where students can, can choose what they want to work on, and you could run something like Yellowcraft in your school. Um, if you have, um, particularly if you have people who identify as female or, or girls or women who, who are autistic or, or maybe neurodivergent, you could also suggest that they join Yellowcraft sessions as well. Um, They've got some really great mentors who join that so, uh, those weeknight servers uh, and those, those events. And it's also a really good space for people to meet other people with similar interests. Uh, likewise, Orcraft, I, I have um, so much respect for Orcraft. Um, DLTV have had Kate Ringland join sessions before. Kate Ringland is the researcher, she's neurodivergent herself. She's at the University of California in Santa Cruz. Uh, she did her doctoral work around Orcraft, which is the large, uh, the largest server for autistic uh, kids and young adults. I know we've got Jesse here today, who's from Virtual Schools Victoria. I know a lot of these kids and young adults who are at Virtual Schools Victoria join Yellowcraft, uh, Orcraft sessions. I believe there's some that join Yellowcraft as well. Um, it's just such a great service. I'm not involved with Orcraft at all, but it's just brilliant. And we modelled a lot of our Yellowcraft ideas off what Stuart, uh, Stuart set up as a parent of an autistic son and Kate did in her research of that community. So if you're trying to, to um, talk to your school leadership about why you should join Orcraft or Yellowcraft, why you should join those sessions, if you go to Kate, <laughs> it's... I always read it as cateringland.com. It's kateringland.com. Um, if you go to her website, she's got her research there and you can download some of her articles and papers that will help you back up, um, that will help you back up with ev research evidence why yellow, um, why virtual playgrounds are a good model. If you want to start your own using Minecraft Education Edition at lunch times, again, this is another really good way to bring research into the conversation have a research informed discussion with your school leadership team and show them uh, this is um, a way that you can get those kids who are sitting by themselves at lunchtime who may not know how to, uh, who, who may not be interested in football or basketball or down ball, but how they can form real friendships using virtual spaces. Okay, um, digital games based interventions. Myself, <laughs> drawn. But my students, I asked my students to draw themselves and our teaching staff, including me, 
I will never look better than this photo, Kev, I don't think. Uh, I, I was very, very impressed with this particular picture from one of my students in terms of my um, my muscles. That's not a realistic at all, but I keep using it because I've never looked better. Um, this is was the students that I worked with, a representation by them, and the teaching assistants I worked with. We also had other students who I've worked with since who helped to inform uh, the program. So this has really been a team effort in getting digital games-based intervention off, off the ground. Uh, so we did, uh, today I'm gonna focus really on stage B. Um, so the idea that what you do during coaching, during play. So I wanna focus on stage B. Stage A and stage C are very, very important. But stage B is what I get most of the questions around. Okay, so we talked about which skills to use. These are examples of inclusive collaborative skills. Things like sharing task information. What can that look like? What are the different ways to do this? What's encouraging? What does it mean? Why do we encourage in, during success? But why do we encourage during you know, experiences of failure as well. What does taking turns look like? What's checking for understanding look like? What are these giving nonverbal instructions? It's really, really important that we can name the skills that we're focusing on and the skills that we, the benefit, the specific skills that uh, our programs are targeting a, it gives us a warrant to continue these programs. B, it helps us to be able to think about what can the students do now? And in terms of learning, where do we want them to go? So it's really important that we think about specific skills that are important in the, the, the construct that we call collaboration and to be able to talk about these. Through, through the original PhD research, we identified 15 high priority skills uh, and we focus specifically on how we can increase the frequency and um, sophistication of use of these skills. And this will be key to your success in being able to secure school funding for your programs in the future. So the stage B structure, we run uh, stage A typically for about 15 minutes. Then we do about 50 minutes of play on an hour, an hour and a half session. Then we'll have about 15 minutes uh, reflection and then we'll have a, about 10 minutes free time. In a one hour, if you're running a one hour session, you want to keep this, the stage B section of your time being the biggest part. So you want about, you really want about 60% of the time you spend in digital games based intervention to be focused on uh really focused on the play we want to have ongoing cycles of playing and the staff monitoring and coaching and then having regular timeouts so we often do 10 minutes of play then two minutes of timeout just to provide feedback on skill use but also to give the uh to give our players a chance they put their controls down, put their keyboards down, and to communicate about their strategies, about what they want to do in the next 10 minutes. Breaking it down to those 10 minute blocks is really key because it allows us to focus on the teaching. It's different from virtual playgrounds in the sense that we have a very interventionist role. So we would often run three cycles in a session. Uh, and that's 36 minutes if I was running a school, if I was running a, a school based program. So 36 minutes of intervention. It is a very tight session because most lunch breaks are one hour. <laughs> you always have people who are very slow eating their sandwiches. I let them eat their, their sandwiches or lunch if they're running a bit late uh, during stage A uh, when we're doing the skill instruction. But you really want to make sure you have about 36 minutes of, of play. Um, you need to be able to track the skills during play. So we've got a system we developed for tracking each of their skills they use and for setting goals. It's important that they have meaningful goals. 
It's important what they understand what those goals look like during play. We talk about that and set those goals in stage A. But during stage B, we want to track which skills they're using. And during the timeout, we want to talk about the skills that you have seen them using. It's not a competition. It's not who can use the most skills. That's why the, each chart only has uh, four boxes for using the skills. Uh, but the idea being that you want to make sure that you are keeping track and then giving feedback on the skills they've used and then giving them like labeled praise. You want to be able to say, hey, I really like the way that you shared task information where in Raymond Legends, when you're trying to get through that trap, it was really important because that helped other people to understand what to do. There's a, there's a good format that I use with my, um, with the people that I run our programs, we run our programs with, that's key to, to giving really meaningful feedback around skill performance and linking it back to the game and linking it then to positive outcomes. People ask me, what do I do as a teacher? Well, you actually have multiple roles. So we have often two staff members, often a teacher and a teaching assistant. Uh, we'll have a program leader and we'll have a program assistant. When the kids are playing, you're providing ongoing feedback and encouragement and you're supporting attempts at the use of skills during gameplay. That's when someone's trying to do something and they haven't just got, got it right, you're talking them through that. Likewise, the teaching assistant or the program assistant is offering advice to individual students. Often our students are quite shy. So getting down like to the level and just whispering with them or using a whiteboard to have a conversation with them can be a really private way. Uh, yeah, Mar Marika, is this for digital games-based intervention or for, um, for virtual playgrounds? I'll just let you type that in the chat. There's a, yeah, intervention, I'll show you at the end. <laughs> and then receiving feedback on the use of skills. Um, that's during the timeouts. The leader gives the feedback. The program assistant really helps to provide the uh, support um, to help make sure that kids are focused in, tuned in, listening. We use a range of communication supports during stage B. We have a visual activity schedule so people can see at all times what they're supposed to be doing and then where to next. We use a timer so people know how long for play, how long for feedback. Uh, and then we use whiteboards and communication cards. If someone needs a break, and they're feeling really agitated and they can't find the words, we have a break card. And we explicitly teach how to use that. We also have a timeout card. If someone, if the group, they wanna share some really important information and they're getting really agitated, we'll call a timeout. They can use a timeout card. They'll pause the timer. They don't lose any playing times. The players know that means controllers down, headsets down if they're playing on multiple machines. Um, and it's about listening to that player they won't lose any playing time. That's the really central message. We pause the timer and then we resume the timer when they're finished communicating. And there's also a help card and that's for players who are a bit shy, who need help knowing controls, need help knowing where to go, what to do. And the program assistant can subtly come across next to them and just help them. I've helped players with fine motor skill issues playing, like if we're playing on a PS5 controller, they'll use the analog stick or D-pad and I'll do the buttons, we'll sort of play together. But that help card's a really important tool in letting your players communicate with you. They want help, but it protects their dignity and privacy. Setting up the space, this is how I set it up. As a photo, I have the chairs around there. I will often have a tripod either facing the players when they're playing or have it behind them facing the screen. The main thing is you want footage for stage A. I'll have the timetable on the table. They can see when they come in. Uh, and I'll have lots of access to things like fidgets. We use um, gaming hats or like Mario hats or something to sort of build a bit of, a bit of fun into the program. Um, but you want to make sure that uh, because of the eye contact issue specifically, you don't have necessarily have to have the players forced to sit looking at each other. They like looking at the screen. So we use a lot of local cult games. Now, I'm aware it's at 458. These are the things that when we're picking games that we found to be really important. And this is through these hours and hours of video, anal research, uh, video analysis in the research. So what game design mechanics or rules of play best create the conditions for collaboration? We identified 
are 39 principles of game design. So these are things that are really key that, and we organize them into subcategories, but the four big overarching themes were, does the game create a positive player identity as being part of a team? Do the rules of play create the conditions for interaction between the players? Does the impact of level design upon the application, what does level design do uh, to the application or performance of social skills? And does game design serve as an enabler or a barrier for the inclusion of all players? I'm just going to focus on, for example, in player identity within a team. Games like uh, Super Mario, uh, Super, this is Super Mario 3D World, is really good, a really good example because they're recognisable characters. If you're working with players who have co-occurring intellectual disabilities, they can easily find themselves on the screen. Um, they can choose how they're represented. One issue we found with uh, new Super Mario 3D World is unfortunately kids learn some pretty sexist norms from a young age. So I worked with a group of boys. No one wanted to play as Princess Peach. So I had to model, explain why I thought Princess Peach is the best character. And I made sure I always played as Princess Peach. And that's because Princess Peach, if you've played Mario, you know, has that floating ability. You'll see here, she can float from platform to platform. Functionally, I think she's the best. I also think she's pretty cool. Unfortunately, a lot of my boys, even eight, nine years old, didn't want to play as the girl wearing pink. We tried to model for them that it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely fine for boys to wear pink and explain for boys to play as Princess Peach and to challenge some of those things they've learned. I highly recommend you doing the same thing. Um, so this is Diablo 3, if you're working with older kids, um, just making sure that non-playable characters um, forge the identity as a team. So this is the idea that your NPCs or non-playable characters in story-driven games help create an atmosphere that you are a team working together. A lot of the kids I work with love the law. They love the law of the Diablo universe. They love the law of things like Skyrim or um, Dark Souls. So it's really helping ensuring that your games create a sense of collective uh, achievement as a team. Um, interdependent progress through design constraint. Um, this is the idea that you can't leave anyone behind and you have to work together. Sea of Thieves, I talked about as one of my favorite games on the right hand side here, is a great example of that. Players have to steer ships together. One person will have to read the map one person will have to run the sails. One person uh, will have to um, steer the um, uh, steer the ship. And it's the idea that the game creates, through the rules of play, creates these conditions where no one player can make it or break it for the team. They have to work together. And you can't leave people behind. Um, game feedback on individual and team performance. You really want to choose games that focus on success being measured as a team rather than individual progress. By that, if you have a look at Raymond Legends here, the score screen uh, on the left-hand side, this is a 2D platform game, a bit like Super Mario, where players have to work together. In the middle, in the red, in big bold letters, is the team score. It does show how many items individuals co collected, but it really celebrates by the positioning of that feedback in the center of the screen, that what matters is the screen. One of the things I don't like about new Super Mario Brothers 3D World on the right hand side is the player who comes first is shown by a graph at the end. And you see the fourth player is probably not going to be feeling too good about themselves, but the first player gets a crown. And we think about mindset theory and what that does around growth mindsets and fixed mindsets, if we're using that, that sort of language around. Um, us, you know, educational psychology, really the idea that we want people to always, to not necessarily think that they're the best and they have the crown. It's about us always being learners and what really matters is that team success. Uh, finally, um, a lot of the players really found it hard when they're using shared avatars. And this is the idea of like, this is an example of Star Fox Zero, which is a Wii U game in, uh, from 2016 where one player steers the ship and one player controls the weapons. Some people found this really frustrating. 
because you have different skill levels. So we allow games like Super Mario. We prefer games like New Super Mario Brothers 3D World where everyone controls their own character as part of the team. Um, it's important you have game design mechanics that promote leadership. I'm going to skip ahead, Nathan, because I think we're going to run out of time. Um, the last thing is I really think about the controllers you use and how important they are, allowing options in how players can interact. Whether you're playing Minecraft, whether you're playing on a Switch, or you're playing on an older console with Wii U or an Xbox Series X, X or S, doesn't matter if you're playing on PCs, allowing multiple options for playing is really key to creating inclusive gaming clubs. The biggest challenges we hear are around um, how do we actually use it in a evidence-based and pedagogically sound way, whether that be virtual playgrounds, but particularly digital games-based um, uh, intervention, uh, concerns around violence and video games, and the cost of getting programs started up. I'll address the easiest one to address is violence is that I say as a teacher and as a professional, I choose age appropriate games that have positive messages for our kids. It's a really simple answer. We're not playing Grand Theft Auto. We're not playing Dark Souls. Just like there's R-rated movies, you don't go and show, show an R-rated movie to a 10-year-old. You don't give them an R-rated game. It's very simple. We are carefully selecting. We are professionals. We are carefully selecting our age appropriate games that best create the conditions for collaboration. Cost, you don't have to use the latest gear. You can use older consoles. A lot of really great co-op games on a PlayStation 3, on Xbox 360, get it by second hand. Um, if you have multiple teachers running programs in the school, get a library and share. We always buy physical copies so we can share physical copies rather than getting digital so it's stuck on that one machine in case that machine you know, dies. Um, and the pedagogy is really important. Um, <laughs> bit of a plug at this stage. I have released my first book, which is based on my research around this, which does give intervention guides. So if you'd like to have a look, um, there's uh, a link to my book. And I've, we're also running next year, we've got a school-based teacher training program. This is part of this social enterprise I set up with Jess. Jess is um, my colleague at the University of Melbourne. She's a speechy. We want to, our goal and what we're doing is we want to run neurodivergent led programs. So we hire um, autistic adults or adults with ADHD. We train them and we get them to run programs uh, for our neurodivergent kids. And the idea is we want to try to hire as many people as possible. We're also, We've also been asked to develop a training program for teachers so they can run these programs in their schools as lunchtime clubs or Friday afternoon clubs or whenever they like to run them. Uh, so you can do this yourself. You can get the book and you can have a read and all the resources are in there. The skills are in there. There's research uh, for Maria who asked, you might be watching the recording. There's a whole chapter on the research behind this and some of the evidence that informs this program. And then there's also the training program will run workshops in your school and give you the practical implementation advice. That's launching next year. We are trying to make sure the people who run the training have that lived experience of neurodivergence. Uh, it's really important to our, our social mission. Nathan, that's, um, oh, and there are my contact details. And I'm sorry, I've left you two minutes for the Q&A. <laughs> no worries, Matt, that was terrific. Thank you. Um, look, the only one that I wanted to uh, point to was um, Roger uh, posted a, about the what the work that he's doing at his school. Yeah, and right. I'll I'll stop the recording in a moment. Roger did offer to show us um, the setup because he's at his at his room there. So uh, that was one. And then the other one, Lydia had a question: What games should be good for senior or junior school? Um, so I guess that's a pretty big question, like the kind of games that are suitable for, for juniors and seniors. I think Matt made a really good point that we don't show R-rated movies to kids, so why would we be any different with games? Um, but as you said, Matt, it's also about what you want the students to get out of the game. You know, like, just like with movies, there's junk games and there's there's better ones, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a really common question about the games. Oh, I'm really excited to see what Roger's doing because I know he does some great stuff as well. And there's so many teachers who are doing great work in this space. 
Um, when I first started, there weren't too many people who I could connect with who were doing stuff. And it's just been so exciting seeing what teachers are doing independently um, and just trying to, I'd love to connect and, and learn from you and to work with you and, and exchange that information. And at the end of the day, what we want is to get this out there. So it'd be great. Um, just in terms of games, we give example of 17 games in the last chapter of the book that we use and explain why we use them. And which of the 39 principles that we look for in games that they adhere to. So we kind of give them a bit of a score based on those four overarching categories out of five stars or five game pads. Um, just some examples. But if you want two players working together, if you want to run lots of stations, I love Untitled Goose Game. Don't know if anyone's played that, but you work as uh, two geese and you go around causing chaos, trying to steal sandwiches and one person and you play as a, a goose each and you have to move around this the picture of goose game on the screen now actually um it's melbourne developed it's fun kids love it because you're causing chaos um but you have to strategically work together so you have to coordinate your actions to cause distractions while someone else is stealing the sandwich or you have to uh turn the sprinkler on and wet a farmer it's a, kids think it's hilarious but it really requires quite sophisticated planning, strategy, and language use, particularly ex expressive, receptive language, how you communicate things clearly, but how you also, how you're listening and check for understanding. It's really important. Um, one other resource that I can recommend uh, is uh, the, the ACME have uh, a bit of a focus on game related lessons and things. So this is less, less to do with game programs in schools and more to do with using games in your teaching. So I've just put the link to that resource as well in yeah, the chat, but you can look it up on Acme. It's called Game Lessons. And I think a few of the teachers who have joined us today have actually um, have actually been uh, involved in writing those lessons, Nathan, which is really cool. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll turn off the recording now. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, Kev, did you want to quickly say yeah, I just, you? I just wanted to say, Matt, I'm, I mean, you do a great job with DLTV as the vice president and, um, to, to come up today and do this. I know you're very, very busy. It's really, really appreciated. And um, yeah, no, you did a fantastic job. I may even buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.